Hello everyone, so uh, we're into another question and answer session, the last one before Christmas. And uh, first of all, thanks for all the emails and all the comments and stuff. We get a lot of emails uh, coming in on our comment page uh, off the website. And uh, um, yeah, it's all about GGR and how happy everyone is and the family's growing and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of Merry Christmas, so likewise to everyone that's watching. And uh, we'll uh, be thinking of our guys out there uh, spending a very lonely Christmas on their boats. Uh, happy to be there, very special one, they'll remember it. I've gone through only one at sea like that uh, in a circumnavigation and it's always special, you remember it really well. So uh, very, uh, a very big day for them uh, and they'll all have a mixed bag. Some will be in heavy weather, some will be in good weather, things like that. So one thing I want to, uh, I figure anyone who's watching this, you're the hardcore of the GGR family, you want to make sure you have a look at um, this new series of questions uh, from the entrance. Uh, that we're slowly starting to put up now. What happened was uh, there were six, uh, three sessions of about 15 or 16 questions. The first one they got about a year before the start of the race. The next one they got about six months before the start. And the last one was about four months before the start. And it's interesting to hear their answers in relation to pretty tricky questions, some very personal questions, uh, and then now having got to know them and understand their experience during the course of the race. Now, some of the entrants did all three series of questions. Some of those that joined late only did two or some only did one. And surprisingly, I just found out that Gregor didn't do any. I don't know how he got away with that, but anyway, because um, I've been reviewing them and there's some classics there. So uh, slowly but surely, we'll be releasing them. There's, there's quite a few over the next uh, couple of months and they're really worth listening to. Um, so uh, remember that as well. So uh, this last week, a uh, big change for Igor that popped up uh, unexpectedly. We we mentioned a month about a month ago uh, about Igor and some of the challenges he was happening uh, that were happening to his boat and himself. You know the the whole idea of uh, going so slow. Anyway, he did the medical uh, in Albany and it brought up some issues. They sent the results back to uh, Russia, their team doctor, and uh, and so now he's in Russia. And the decision will be made in the next number of days whether he's got to have this operation. So um, if he does, the process is that he'll have to then complete, uh, once he's recovered, he'll have to complete a GGR medical. And once he's approved for that, then he can rejoin the event in Chichester class. There is no timeline for the event. He could finish at any time. Um, and uh, the big issue for us will be getting him past Cape Horn. That, that's very important. And generally, it's accepted. If, you, if you're still there after the end of March, it's getting a little bit late. So it's important from our perspective that he's able to achieve all that and uh, get around by the end of March. So um, we'll be monitoring that. We've given him an, a, a, a date. We want to see him set sail by January the 14 or 15, somewhere there and that gives him about two and a half months to get uh, across uh, through New Zealand and across the Pacific side of the Southern Ocean and hopefully get around by the end of March. So, um, so we'll have to uh, uh, keep our fingers crossed with that. Uh, Tapio is still uh, plodding along and uh, quite happy. He's always happy. You know, if you look at his look at his tweets and comments, and he sent some classic ones for Christmas, which we'll put up. Uh, uh, he's just content. He's happy to be there. Uh, very disappointed at how you know his challenges. He's got on board the boat uh, right from the beginning. He's had little issues, but he's making steady progress, and uh, we look forward to when he finally gets around. Uh, I've had a good review over the weather the last week. You might have seen or this coming week. You might have seen the um, the live report this morning on the tracker. He looks pretty pretty right for the next week. It's pretty benign weather. Um, he's got a couple of days of headwinds coming up, and so he's uh, you know going to get there eventually. We're really hoping he can make it back to uh, La de Lone here before the prize giving on April the twenty second. Um, you know we'd love to see him there if he can get rid of those barnacles sometime soon. Um, he's got a chance of making it. He doesn't think he will. He doesn't think he'll be there until the beginning of June. But uh, hopefully he'll speed up in a couple of little places and, and hopefully he's got it terribly wrong because we'd love to see him there. Um, Istvan still uh, challenged. He managed to make the bearings on his uh, steering pedestal. He, he fabricated them, so it was looking okay. The bearings seemed to be working, but in the storm he had the other a couple of days ago, he said the bolts came out and the, the bearing cage must have fallen apart or something. But he managed to fix it during the night, and so that's back on track. He's still been challenged a bit with his, with his uh, wind vane, 
uh, you know, trying to steer the boat. That's normal in heavy weather, you know. Um, it's always challenging at the best of times. He's got this issue with interfacing the wind vane through the steering gear, through the ship's rudder and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so he's still got challenges, but he's making progress. And it's incredible because he's now, you know, in the big picture, he's running fourth. Uh, in the race and uh, when he was half just at the start of the Atlantic you know uh, everyone cleared out on him he was literally stone last just about and so um, his persistence and uh, just being there at the end of the day maybe sailing conservatively always working he's always got something on the go um, is paying dividends and we're looking forward to getting him around Cape Horn or seeing him around Cape Horn He's um, in mixed weather right now. He's surrounded by typical Southern Ocean stuff. His message this morning was 70, uh, 55 knots. He had big seas and uh, you know, he said his trysail was getting a really good workout. Uh, that's gonna hold with him for the next three, four days. Uh, he's about 55 degrees south. He's very much in deep Southern Ocean. He's in the furious 50s. Um, but if there's any consolation to that, um, this time of the year there, it's the right time to be there. And uh, he is uh, not looking like any nasty, vicious, dangerous storms coming in the next seven or even eight days, if we can be reliable enough to look forward to that kind of weather. Um, so, you know, it's sort of okay. He's doing fine. Um, most of the things on the sailing systems for the boat are all good. His electronics are wiped out. He's got no radio now of any consequence. He can't get messages out on the HF. So he doesn't get reliable weather reports. He's got a barrel graph and he understands the Southern Ocean really well. He's done two previous circumnavigations through the Southern Ocean and stuff. And, and so he, using the barometer, he gets an idea and we keep an eye out on anything that's really quite extreme and, and uh, tip him off on that as well. So uh, we're watching that. Uku, uh, oh, and, he, and he says he hopes to be around by the new year. He had originally planned some month, month or so ago to be around for Christmas, but it's not, not been the case. So he's now hoping to get around on the new year and uh, start heading north back, back home up here. Um, the um, situation with um, Uku, uh, he uh, got around okay, had a great rounding, very typical, he was very excited to see Cape Horn. He, he, he loved that, obviously, very emotional moment, always is. Um, and uh, he's taken a track now, he's, he's doing the traditional sailing route. He's gonna leave the Falklands to the port as he goes past, he's gonna go white. Um, things are looking good for the moment, but it looks as if from the weather forecast, in about three or four days, there is a large storm, very tight one forming right in the middle of his track. So uh, we'll be interested to see what his planning is there, whether he's going to uh, head inshore or whether he's going to try and slow down or whatever. Anyway, anything could change. It's still about four or five days out, but we'll be watching that because it is a dandy. It's a really big one. Uh, there's a huge area of forecasting 65, 70 knots. That means it's going to you know, blow harder than that even. So uh, watch this space. That'll be very, very much um, uh, exciting to see uh, how it develops. The uh, situation with Jean-Luc and um, uh, Mark Slats. Mark is driving hard. There's no question, you know, when you wipe out your Dodger and uh, uh, you, you can't make phone calls, you, you, you know, life is healing and smashing and banging and spray on deck, all that sort of stuff. He is driving really hard. There's no question about that. Um, he knows how to manage his boat. He's still physically very strong. He's mentally focused. Uh, everything on the boat's working, so why not, you know? Um, and uh, he's got confidence in his boat. He knows he's sailing uh, really well. The boat's lighter, things like that. So he took out more time on Jean-Luc, but now it uh, looks like the gate's open for Jean-Luc. Uh, he's in the realms now of uh, easterlies. He, he shouldn't get any more headwinds. Um, and very soon he'll start to free sheets. He'll start crack off and turn the corner and start heading up towards the Caribbean there in the trades and he'll rock it away. Um, so Mark, so you'll see him pull away for sure. He'll pick up another 100 miles or a couple hundred miles maybe even before Mark can do anything about it. But Mark's got a game plan. You can see it. If you saw the post this morning, I won't go over it again. Um, you know, he, he knows what he's doing and he's, he's doing remarkably well. Um, so he's, he's got a plan. He's going to stick to it and it looks pretty good. And it's typical that when one sort of got, you know, Jean-Luc went that slow bit. Now he's through. Jean-Luc's going to tick off. Uh, Mark has to catch up and then as soon as Mark gets in there, he's going to pile away again. So, uh, uh, so the race is still very much on and, and um, you know, it's very hard to predict. I'm still saying they should be around here about the 28th of January. They could be earlier. Uh, we're going to be at the Dusseldorf Boat Show on the weekend of the 19th and 20th. If you're there, we'll see you there. We've got a, a talk on the, some presentations on Saturday and Sunday. Um, but I just hope they don't get too early. <laughs> and they could. It's really hard to call. So, uh, so yeah, all kind of very interesting. Um, okay, so straight into the questions. Um, 
Derek uh, Leach was wondering about um, uh, growth on the hulls, all the barnacles. Do, do we think that, that uh, it's different now than it was in 1968? Um, you know, and that's really hard to say because, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist or anything like that. And certainly the results that the uh, guys are getting, some of them with their barnacle infestations are completely different than uh, 1968 because you don't hear that uh, report coming from Robin. Uh, Matessia doesn't talk about it much. They certainly go over the side. Robin was swimming regularly. Uh, he'd just jump over the side and swim beside the boat until it catches up to him and, and uh, climb up back on board. Um, so they would have had barnacles, but um, you know, there's nothing to say it was any worse or any better. Uh, it could just be the paints now. Uh, as you know, there's a lot less toxins in the paints you know, for, to look after the environment. Uh, some of the paints may not have been applied the right way on our boats uh, versus 1968. Uh, Robin put heaps of paint on. He, he painted the bottom again, I think, the day before he left or day, a couple of days before he left. So uh, it's, a, it's a hard one to call. And the other one was, um, he was wondering about the difference in the weather reporting now that our guys are getting compared to 1968. Uh, and would that have, have a, uh, an effect? And there's no question it does, obviously, because um, there's very good weather reporting for this race. Uh, uh, a lot of the ham radios are working, the HF radios are working, so they're able to talk to their teams and they can access uh, Windy TY, exactly the same as on the tracker. So everyone's got a very good understanding of, of where the weather is and what's happening so they can make decisions on board. Um, Istvan, for instance, uh, doesn't have a radio, so he's got to do a lot of that management himself. Um, but it, it really showed in the Atlantic legs coming south that a lot of the boats took the middle route, going right through the middle of what's tra traditionally a great big high. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and Mark Slats and uh, I think it was Gregor <coughs> took the, the traditional route, going wide around, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Atlantic there, following the traditional follow, following breezes. So, uh, yeah, it, it, has an, it has an effect, definitely. Uh, there's better weather forecasting now than last. Uh, okay, uh, in, uh, Yinta Jan uh, was wondering about, um, oh, in the 2022 race, whether the Joshua class should finish in Tahiti. That'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? But uh, it doesn't really work for the race. Um, but he mentioned something which is a good way to bring it up. He says he hopes that the 2022 race uh, might start in Plymouth or Falmouth, okay? Now, 22 has been posted. The dates are going to change a little bit with celebrating uh, uh, Bernard Matessia and, and the, um, his uh, efforts in the 1968 race in, in Joshua. And Joshua actually started from Plymouth. Now, it's my understanding while there's been no uh, agreements reached with anything to do with the 22 race, there's some interest in uh, uh, that race from, from parties to uh, support it as the host port, and we always remember our friends. So, um, uh, you know, it can't be assumed it'll start in, in England. We think it'll start in France somewhere. And we'll uh, very soon be posting um, the plans for our uh, prologue in the UK. Uh, you'll remember we, we started in F Falmouth this time on celebrating June the 14th. Uh, the boats came across in the Citran Challenge race. It worked really well. It gave a chance for the entrance to settle down. We'll do exactly the same thing in, in 2022. And it could... It, it'll be open to any port that wants to host the GGR in England. So uh, if Falmouth come up and say, yeah, we'll look after you, we'll give you berthing and put on blah, 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 blah. Uh, it could be Plymouth, could be Portsmouth, could be anywhere. Um, so uh, um, watch this space. and, and we'll, uh, We certainly won't be asking any, uh, uh, any questions of anyone until after Brexit's, Brexit's over, whatever's going to happen there, because it's causing a bit of uh, uncertainty. But, but uh, it's highly likely that there will be um, uh, a port in the UK hosting the GGR sort of prologue. And it'll be a bit bigger this time. We'll probably stay over there for about six days and have a bit of fun. And then we'll race across to France and then we'll do the race village thing and restart. And it'll start now. The race is going to start in 2022 on uh, August the 21st, uh, which is a Sunday. It's one day earlier than when uh, Benabatessia started in Joshua. So, And that's seven weeks um, behind uh, the uh, the current edition, so um, uh, it sets the scene a little bit differently. Tim Miller uh, was uh, wondering about the ability of the boats, the, the GGR style boats, p pointing to windward, going to weather. You know what what what's the deal there? Uh, he apparently might own, or he sa certainly sails on a Rustler thirty six, and uh, it points really really well, and and can easily do six knots to windward in force four to five. He's saying. And he's wondering whether uh, our boats are able to point that well. 
and uh, is it a, especially over a long period of time is it too tiring for the crew it certainly is i mean there's nothing worse than being uh, hard on the breeze in a bit of a sea like a two meter or two and a half three meter sea banging your way to windward your life is on a heel all the time you know there's water everywhere it's stressing the boat and all of those things mean that it's, it's highly unlikely even for mark uh, mark slats that he's hard on the breeze as if he's racing around the boys in normal typical club racing um, that's not the sort of hard on the breeze that you'd get in a round the world race. When Mark is hard on the breeze, he's pointing to windward, but he wouldn't be, he'd be cracked off just a little bit, so that's a bit better. He can point well because he doesn't have furling gear. If you look at, by a worst case example, it's Tapio, he's got two furling gears up there and they're a little bit loose. They've got fixed length four stays, so um, he can't adjust the tension on the furling gears. He's got to crank in his back stay and he's cranked it in as far, hard as he can, but he's still got four stay sag, so he, he doesn't point to windward very well uh, but generally you're certainly in a round the world race you're not as hard on as you are going around in a club race but you can still point high and mark's pointing as high as he's comfortable with so uh, and he'll last as long as he possibly can and just hang on for the ride you just get in your bunk and and just let it do its thing and monitor and listen you know you don't want to stress the boat too much because even mark has to be careful he doesn't overload the boat you know um few people have been telling me that so oh, he might be pushing it too hard because even though he hasn't got any damage or whatever on the boat now mark knows he's got to pace himself he's got a it's still a long way to the finish so um so the boats all of the boats can point to windward okay but they do it in a different way and some better than others mark's probably with the current fleet he's got the ability to point to windward better than any other boat in the fleet right now okay because he doesn't have furling gear um mark dyson uh, what's the uh, most unexpected thing about the ggr um, what's the most unexpected thing about the GGR? For, he's asking me that question, and I, I'd have to say it's the dismastings. Um, you know, we knew we were going to get storms and all the rest of it, but uh, we've lost uh, five rigs. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, as you know, you know, we, 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 everyone's interested in why and how and all that stuff, and I'm not sure we'll find any answers, but certainly, um, I mean, there's some discussions now even. If you look at Gregor's, Gregor said when he lost his mast, the, the section uh, below the first spreaders on the main mast, it broke into three pieces, which is really interesting. You said, well, how can that happen? What's going on here? Um, and so you might, one of the things that's happening, and even I'm thinking about it, you might see some more rigging in there. I remember a guy called Lars Bergstrom, who's uh, you know, we're quite good friends for many years. Uh, he, he's not with us anymore, but um, his rigs were quite tricky. You know, He had lightweight stuff, but he had a lot of little rigging bits, right, to, to really hold the section on the big mass section, huge sail area, things like that. But there might be something in that. Maybe there's some more rigging elements that can go into the spar to hold it in column, even in a rollover or, a, or even a pitch pole. So, uh, you know, there, it'll be an interesting discussion to have with the mass makers and the riggers later on. You know, we're all too busy right now just, you know, managing the race and finishing. But I think there'll be some very interesting discussions in the next in the next um, uh, 12 months or so. Um, so yeah, and apart from that, the, the second most amazing thing is the speed. I had no, none of us had any idea that that um, the leaders would be making the times that they are. And imagine if Sean Luke hadn't damaged his mast, you know, he'd be here in a few weeks. Um, that's a surprise. When Barry and I actually ran a computer model on potential speeds. I came up with, you know, I, I, mine wasn't a computer model, mine was using my brain, and I came up with a time of about 140, uh, 235 days or, or 230 something days, and Barry did one and came up with 200 days, and I just said, oh, there's no way, Barry, they're going to get damaged, they won't get the weather like that, all this sort of stuff, and so we said, right, we'll have two versions of that, we'll have this one here at 200 and something days, and we'll have this one here at realistic option at 230, and this was the best possible time to alert the media in the world before the start of where they could be at certain time of the year and here they are um, they're still rocketing around and and uh, that's that's created some interesting issues again you know they're going to be up here in the in the uh, Atlantic when there's still some um, um, you know heavy weather uh, towards the finish so so yeah there's a few surprises there um, the other question he asks is how how am I going to cope with uh, normal life after the GGR well Jane and I we we sort of normally live in Tonga we've got a little island there called Namukiki and and uh, that's that's home and um, we've got a boat as well but um, the focus is and he's leading into the question because there's going to be a lot to do after this GGR is finished and that's exactly right you've got to remember though that the lead into this race uh, you know Jane and I were working pretty much uh, full-time on it for a couple of years beforehand and, and part-time prior to that 
So yes, there will be a presence for GGR straight after this one's finished. You know, we'll, we'll have a, an admin that's running things because time moves fast and 2022 will be here before you know it. Um, I'm, I still have a focused objective to be sailing in my Joshua boat, which is currently being built uh, or it's half built, uh, stop now in Turkey until this race is over. Uh, we're determined now to get that in the water by the end of next year. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'll have a few things to do. It'll we, Once it's in the water, it'll be brought to the Saab de Lone and, and uh, that becomes our base here for a while and, and we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, we'll cope. GGR is part of our life and uh, I just want to get down there and hopefully sail it. But, but the important thing is that we really want to find uh, the right sponsors and... Uh, uh, make it better than what it is now. I mean, there's a lot of things we could have done. There's a lot of questions, or well, people are asking, how come the French media haven't gone you know, on this? There's a few reasons for that. One is it's over a huge amount of time. Um, so it's over like six months or so. It's not just a three month sprint. So there's these peaks that come through. And secondly, it, it costs a lot of time and money to generate media. You know, it doesn't just happen. The media just doesn't come in and swamp you. You need a team of people and you need to be generating stories all the time. You need to be ringing all the, the media organizations and say, hey, you want to cover this story or here's an angle for you and all that stuff. That costs a huge amount of money and we just don't have that budget. You know, Barry's running our media team. Caroline helps her, um, you know, part time, helps Barry part time. Um, our budgets are minuscule, absolutely minuscule compared to the millions of euro that other races have got and all that sort of thing. So, so yeah, we'll be focused on, you know, we'll be very busy once this race is finished, um, but focused on 2022. Um, okay. Um, Mick. Uh, Lally, uh, time for Igor to get to Cape Horn. Well, I mentioned that. You know, we, we, you know, is there a set time for him to do it? Yes, there is. We've announced that. The other thing that this brought up was that, um, you know, uh, if we look at the fleet now, they're coming through Cape Horn at the right time. And some people asked us in the beginning, you know, why did we leave so early? Uh, that was generalised around June the 14th being the start of Suheili leaving. Yes, the boats are moving faster. We started two weeks after Suheili. When I first conceived the idea of the race, my target date for leaving uh, this part of the world was three weeks after Suheili. Okay, so we ended up going a week earlier than what I even expected. But here's the issue now. I mean, the boats are coming through Cape Horn area at about the right time. If they had been doing the the average speeds that we were thinking, you know, if you say Ugu is about the um, you know average speed, he went round sort of just before Christmas, it's December, it's the perfect time to go around Cape Horn. And Tapio is a bit behind, he's going to be a bit later, but it's still okay. So now the issue, we're going to be starting seven weeks later than we did this year. So think of all the people going around Cape Horn now and add and delay that seven weeks. So instead of going around in, when Istvan goes around on the 1st of January, say, he'll be going around at the end of February, right? Which is only one month before it shuts down. So again, uh, we'll be seven weeks later, but it's certainly not gonna, you know, the boat's gonna have to keep a move on to get around. Um, so, uh, but it is, a, it is a interesting subject for sure. Um, okay, Igor. So Robert Reynolds, um, what type of compass? He was talking about celestial navigation and logs and everything and that the compass is now really important. What type of compass are the entrants using? Uh, most of them have got ordinary compasses. I don't know, they're boats up here in the Northern Hemisphere, so they're probably ordinary. That's a bit tricky when you get, uh, you get down south because you sail closer to the South Magnetic Pole and uh, you, if your compass is normally dipped for the Northern Hemisphere, when you get to the Southern Hemisphere, it's gonna go down. But Plastimo did a, a uniquely double balanced card so that, um, I'm not sure the technicalities of how it works, but, but uh, quite a few of the entrants took the, the special like GGR or Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere compass, which is pretty cool because it means it's balanced all the way around. Um, so uh, it's good for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and, and apart from that, they're pretty, pretty normal sort of yachting compasses. So nothing in particular uh, that's, that's super special, except for that Plastimo one, that's quite cool. Um, and also they were wondering about, he was wondering about, uh, do any of them carry radar direction finders? And yes, they do, it's mandatory. Uh, and he was wondering whether the beacons are still active, and yes, they are. Um, there are various beacons. The first, you have maritime beacons, uh, which are often connected to lighthouses and things like that. But you also have aero beacons, okay? That's the beacons that are used for aviation and they're still all active all over the place. And um, you can also then use your radio direction finder even to tune into a radio station, right? Listening to a music type radio station. If you know roughly where their transmitting beacon is, and if you're looking for a general indicator of where that might be on the chart, you've got all three options. 
And interestingly, a few of the entrants, uh, you know, maybe three of the entrants, actually had already used their radio direction finder on a couple of occasions uh, coming into Lanzarote and a few others when they're making landfalls. So uh, it's actually proven uh, of use. So I won't say super valuable, but it's proven of use. And in certain situations, if they damage their sextants and uh, all these other things, if they had other issues, it, it definitely an aid for navigation. So um, anyone using a GPS cruising now probably doesn't even know what a radio direction finder is, but um, they are required for GGR. They have already been used uh, two or three times uh, and are of value. Uh, so, and you get the beacons and everything out of the list of radio signal and lights. You know, you get uh, the, the maritime beacons and you get or aeronautical ones as well. So, and they're marked on the chart usually, or not all of them, but most of them. Uh, okay, so uh, Anse Vorham was asking, uh, please explain the penalty box again. Uh, well, we've just made a decision. Some of you may be following the issue of the penalty box. I'll explain it where it is now, and I did this last weekend as well. But it's basically you have, uh, here's the equator down here, and I'm looking at you. There, there's the equator. Every time you go north 10, 15, 20 degrees, that's, <coughs> excuse me, north latitude. <coughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, it's set at 45 degrees north up here. And the idea is that when... Uh, the sailor sailing north towards the finish line in La Sable de Lone. <coughs> they uh, cross 45 degrees north, and as soon as they cross it, they have to turn around and sail back below it again, and they have to stay south of 45 degrees north until such time as they've finished their time penalty, which in the case of Jean-Luc is 18 hours, and then they go north and through again, and they can carry on and finish. Now, the issue, that's how it works. That's the penalty box. They can choose where they uh, first cross the line, but once they're down below it, they have to recross it within 40 miles of where they cross, so they can't just come down and keep racing below the line and come up. They've got to come back again within 40 miles. So the issue is that uh, Jean-Luc is now arriving early, and Mark will be doing the same, da 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 so there could be heavy weather out here, uh, quite strong winds. And what we're mindful of is that we don't want them to have to turn around into a gale and try and beat or hold position in a gale. So we've just made the decision on what we'll do and we've lowered now, it's just uh, we've notified uh, Istvan and John Luke um, that we've just lowered the penalty box latitude to 20 degrees north where the weather is a bit more benign and has less chance of damaging the boat or whatever uh, because that's a, a factor of... Um, uh, of the high speeds of the boats in the circumnavigation. Because the other part of the question was, why did we choose 45 degrees north? Um, there's no handicap in the GGR. All the boats are classed the same, right? And uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, and that's that as soon as you start putting handicapping and, and have time adjusting at the end, it confuses people. They can't understand how it works. So by having a penalty box um, you know, that they've got to serve before they get to the finish line, you know that the boat crossing the finish line, he's got no other penalties. Um, that's it, it's easy to understand, they're first across the line. And we wanted to do it close to the finish because it makes it more interesting because the boats coming could be close, just like what's happening. And when there is a, a penalty to be served, everyone can see what's going on and say, wow, that's cool. If we just made it a time penalty, they cross the line here and then we've got to adjust it after, you get like, it gets too hard to, to cope with. So so that, that's how it all evolved. And it, it, it's, you know, to us, it's pretty common sense. But the latitude has now changed to 20 degrees uh, north latitude. So, um, okay, Margaret Keyes was wondering, um, uh, is the cause of cap, is, is it easier to um, capsize at night versus day? Or is it, you know, like, she wanted to know the difference. And it really, technically, if everything's working normally, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night um, because... Uh, if you're not out there hand steering, if you don't have to see the, the waves and things like that, I don't think it'd be uh, any uh, better or worse day or night. It can happen uh, at any time. If it's extreme conditions like that, uh, seeing the waves coming um, aren't necessarily going to help you much unless you're hand steering or have some ability to steer. That might help. If you're assisting with the steering, that might be an issue. But, um, you know, it's a bit, um, you know, I don't think it's day or night too much. Um, it might be a small advantage if, if it's daytime if you are hand steering. And she's asked what sort of visibility is needed. Um, I don't think that's, that's sort of, a, I mean, again, does it help to be able to see what's going on? Probably does. Um, and usually the visibility, you very rarely get fog. You know, you get, you get rain and sleet and hail and things like that, and you certainly get foam out, white out. I've been in sort of 75 knots, you know, probably gusting high. You can't even breathe, you know. You just face away from it, and it's just roaring past you, and you, it's really hard to breathe. Um, so 
Um, it's not so much visibility, it's just hard to look into it. The spray and everything goes nuts. Um, so, uh, and the, the other part, uh, question was one year racing, does it slack the rigging and cause problems? Well, yeah, it can slack the rigging, but you te you know, they'll be watching their rigging, tensioning it up. Uh, the big thing is about wear and tear. I've got a pet theory that you only get about 1.25 uh, times around the world with any standing rigging. So um, if your standing rigging is there and it's done more than one and a quarter times around the world, something's going to break. Um, so uh, you don't want to use it too much before you set off. Uh, but, the, but the engines can adjust it. They can tweak the rigging very easily on board and I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Stuart uh, McEwen. Um, oh, how do I think the time penalty will affect the gap? Um, with uh, oh, he's, he's was the question asking about 45 North and um, all that sort of stuff. Affect the gap between Jean-Luc and, and Mark Slats. That'll be purely dependent on how fast they are and where they are at the time. But 18 hours is a considerable stop. Um, if you say you're moving at five knots, um, that's a long way, you know. Um, it's like if the, the 20 knots, it's, it's sort of like nearly 100 miles difference. So it's going to have an impact, you know. Um, but just watch this space. That's the nature of what it is, and um, it's going to be an interesting finish. So Suzanne, uh, last question, Suzanne Sapano. Um, well, how's Istvan going? <laughs> I think she's probably seen by now um, the things that have been going on with Istvan. He's, he's doing pretty well. Um, I think he's a real plotter and he'll be there at the end of the day. So uh, um, he'll be happy to get around Cape Horn, but then it's still a long way to the finish. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, um, that's really about it. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, remember Citran Bear, if you want to uh, say thanks to GGR and, and enjoying the ride, uh, following all the boats around the world, you can actually um, uh, get onto our charity site, uh, Citran. Um, it's there on the website and there is a Just Giving page there. You can make a donation. So um, uh, that'd be pretty cool. Um, hard to believe that it's uh, already Christmas and hard to believe that we're uh, actually talking about finishing the race. It's, it's quite incredible. We're making activities here now, getting ready to uh, um, receive the first boats in. So watch this space. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next week, which will be after Christmas. See ya. Stay safe.